on to the final session of the day. Um, most of you will know that every two years, the college hosts the prestigious Stephen Roskill Memorial Lecture, named in honor of the naval historian um, and um, um, former senior research fellow here, Captain Stephen Roskill, about whom we've heard so much um, today. And we thought this would be an excellent opportunity to revisit some of those lectures um, and perhaps review and update them in the light of more recent events. Um, but first, I'm going to play a, another short clip by Bill Barnett, our former keeper, who sadly died last year, explaining the origins of the Roskill Lecture. And the Roskill Lecture, what was the... Well, again, I felt that firstly seeing Roskill, uh, I think it must have been after he had died, but anyway, I certainly felt that he ought to be memorialised in some, some way within the college. And I just thought that, an, uh, again, that an, uh, a distinguished visiting lecturer every year or two years would bring the Archive Centre back into the heart of the college and make the Archive Centre appreciated. So it ceased to be, as it were, a quiet corner of the college and became part of the college in a very real way. And also, of course, uh, it, it be, because of these international connections, it, we, we then became known as a, as a major World Archive Centre. Well, Professor David Reynolds was our Roskill lecturer in 2020 when he spoke about the Yalta Summit and its legacy 75 years on. He's Emeritus Professor of International History uh, here in Cambridge and a Fellow of Christ's College. Um, he knows the Archive Centre te team um, and the Archive Centre's collections far better than most and is a very long-standing member of our Archives Committee, which is why I should take this opportunity just to plug his latest book um, out imminently, Mirrors of Greatness, which looks at Churchill, but looks at him through the lens of some of his famous contemporaries. I, I've been lucky enough to, um, to, to see an advanced copy, and it's an absolutely wonderful book. David, over to you. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's my great pleasure to chair this panel where we have three previous Roskill lecturers. And the idea of the panel is to ask them to briefly summarize what it was they were talking about then, and then and tell us how they would update that lecture if they were giving it now. Uh, the loose idea of this, and you will understand that timekeeping is very loose here, uh, is that they'll each talk for 15 minutes. Uh, there'll maybe be one, time for one question at that point, specifically to the speaker. But if we get through the, the sequence of three times 15 and a little bit, then we should have time at the end to talk about uh, some of the larger questions of power, uh, and leadership in the uh, 21st century. And just as a tribute to, to Alan's foresight, apart from organizing this conference and, and all the rest of it, Alan clearly knew when he was planning this conference two, three years ago that uh, last week's New Statesman <laughs> would have as its cover story the a uh, reprise by uh, Paul Kennedy of The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, published 35 years ago, uh, and uh, making a huge impact then. So congratulations to Alan on that. Congratulations to Paul. Oh, but it that. adds to the pertinence of what we're going to be talking about in the course of this, this evening. So um, Paul is uh, the... Uh, J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University. Uh, he's known to you through many books, not least this one, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. Paul started life uh, as a naval historian. He remains a naval historian in his bones. And Paul, in 1997, I think it was, you were, that was your theme when you gave uh, the Roskill Lecture. Yeah. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it and about how you see that, those themes now? In 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, yes. 
And you, I've got a warning card here. You've so. already lost one of them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. And thank you, Alan. And let me just say what a, what a remarkably well-organized, uh, interesting, challenging conference you have put together. If you really did start planning this two and a half years ago, I, I doff my... Off my hat to you. This is uh, this is a remarkable group of uh, contributors, especially the the younger scholars working in the variety of the archives. Yeah. Um, my researchers, ladies and gentlemen, were uh, when I came here first, and I might be among uh, maybe I shouldn't claim this, but I think I was among the first of those coming in the uh, mid 1970s to get into the uh, various papers here in the Churchill College archives because it was becoming clear to a number of scholars that what was happening at Churchill was, was something rather remarkable. It was bringing together, making sure that you could grab a hold of as many uh, papers of former naval officers, admirals, uh, diplomats, ambassadors, members of the cabinet, not just large figures like Churchill and Margaret Thatcher, but for many others, uh, and bring them in this one collection. And that, in the 1970s, was something really different and unusual. Uh, most private papers either were torn up by the family members, burned along with uh, daddy's incriminating letters to his mistresses, or whatever else happened there, and uh, or, or, or went into something like the Chichester local archives or Aberdeen archives and uh, were scattered all over the place. And, or they were being purchased in a significant amount of raids by the University of Texas Harry Ransom Center and William Roger Lewis with a large budget to buy up as many private papers of British statesmen and admirals and others as possible. And then along comes Churchill with its wonderful archive center to be a source of which could bring these all together. And if anybody has, has looked at now at the list of private papers in the Churchill archives, you would just shake your head uh, at what a fantastic, rich variety there is. For me, when I began here in the late 1970s, early 1980s, 80s, ladies and gentlemen, it was um, to get into naval archives, get into the papers of certain um, you know, members of the British naval establishment who might have been military attaché in Berlin or in the British naval intelligence, people who Roskill knew, people who were being persuaded or whose widows were being persuaded to give their, their papers here. And so, that reinforced me in the sort of historian I was that I could come and find these valuable papers here and use them to develop a book I was working on then called The Rise of the Anglo-German Antagonism, uh, 1860 to 1914. So rather than looking at the papers, which, which were many, on the 1930s or appeasement policy or the coming of the Second World War and the unfolding of the war, I was in a rather earlier period. Um, and even when I moved from that Anglo-German antagonism book to begin work on another uh, study called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, I could be identified very firmly therefore as a historian of hard power, whether it was the hard power was military and naval power or uh, diplomatic assessments of, of what Germany was up to, or whether later on I was looking at the economic fundamentals of a nation state compared to others. It was, there was with hard, hard power and naval power. But when I came along a little later at the invitation of Churchill to give my 1997 um, Roskill Memorial Lecture, I was beginning to move along with the movement that had been there with a variety of other historians to think of what are the larger background forces and impulses behind 
these study of admiralties and ships and battles and, and naval policy. Where did the ships come from, ladies and gentlemen? Where were the shipyard areas? What was the social life of those shipyard workers and, uh, and the world they lived in? How could that be brought into a, a larger sort of naval and maritime history? And so when I gave this lecture, it was to try to push the profession, the, the Stephen Roskill profession of British naval policy between the wars or the, the, the war at sea, four volume official history, to push it into thinking of doing naval history, maritime history certainly, but in a broader, more sympathetic, more social economic background to this story of Britain, its place in the world, its beginning to be relative declining place in the world, and how the story can be measured and also shown by looking at the, 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 the naval shipyard background to the story of British naval policy. So Kennedy became a sort of a social historian or a quasi-Marxist historian or some sort of historian other than a mere admiralty policy historian. Um, and I was followed, I think, in the... Uh, David, you asked us to talk a little about where the scholarship was going. I think that the, the scholarship on naval policy and naval studies went that way after the year 2000. And if it, in a sense, it kind of did tilt rather too much in the way of the social background to naval policy and naval studies in which the study of power itself and decision-making itself uh, went by the wayside. And I'm rather pleased to see that maybe over the past 10 to 15 years, the, the sort of circle has turned a little bit and the study of naval policy and maritime policy these years would be both that of the background social circumstances of the shipyard workers and of the society which produced the, the, the fleets that Stephen Roskill talked about, and the decision making and the policy making as well. And so I find myself coming back here um, with feelings of actually some real satisfaction at how well Churchill College in its collation of records, whether it is of the great man Winston himself or of uh, the admirals and uh, policy makers and advisors who surrounded him, but of the many other papers we've heard about in the panels this afternoon, suggest that uh, it has now become one of the major repositories of, of uh, archives and sources on the largest story of Britain in the world and British society from the early 19th century through to the present day. Power is there, but it is done in a more sophisticated and really rather interesting way. And this archive captures so much of that. So the historians who use this archive can only be grateful to the broad-mindedness, Alan, of those who accept a whole variety of papers coming into these archives for a whole variety of historians. I'm, uh, I, I doff my hat. Thanks, David. Well, you've been model of uh, a brevity. Just how would you do naval history now? I would, do, I would do naval history now by, in a way, stealing uh, without remorse of uh, a sort of uh, uh, approaches would have been done by our, our, our 18th century colleagues and people like Nicholas Roger when he writes this book, the, 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 wooden, the wooden World, that is to say, the navies are there, the ships are there, the giant battles at sea, whether it is Trafalgar or the Nile, or uh, the Mediterranean in the Second World War, they are there 
but those ships and come from somewhere, David, and those, those uh, 1,500 men aboard a British battleship in the Mediterranean also come from somewhere and are trained somewhere and recruited somewhere, and therefore I would think that we could do naval history in a rather more complete and uh, rather less single-minded navies at the top, but without disregarding the fact that navies count and the relative success of navies in wartime mm. achieve what was going to be the outcome of the First and the Second World War. Thank you. We've got time, I think, for one question from, from the floor, if there's a question somebody would like to ask. Ah, yes, over here. Thank you. It's actually one of the, thank you very much. Uh, one of the books that you've written, of course, is Engineers for Victory. Um, and of course, Engineers for Victory is inter wonderfully interdisciplinary and shows actually, it's not just the great naval battles, but it's how engineers solve things in remarkable ways. I mean, like the CB, CBBs or something, that's right, and the Huff Duff, you know, and, and all, all those technical things actually made a difference to winning battles. And it wasn't just the sort of brave soldiers and all admirals, it was actually the technologists who contributed in a very major way to victory. Thank and that's one of the things I think the archives shows, without getting more interdisciplinary. And I think that's a wonderful change. Paul, do you want to comment on that briefly? Christopher was very kind in, uh, in a way uh, advertising a later book, actually, ladies and gentlemen, called, called Engineers of Victory, mm -hmm. which was precisely to do that, which is to say, well, who are the engineers who design these giant battleships and aircraft carriers and heavy cruisers? Who are those who do the innovative technologies of, of decipher, deciphering and picking up uh, enemy messages at sea in all sorts of ways? So I should say with one more, one half minute more, the last time I came in to work in the uh, Churchill College archives, ladies and gentlemen, was not actually to look at archival records, but to recognize that this man, Stephen Roskill, had bequeathed his entire naval history library to the college, and there were, uh, if you go into the reading rooms, there are the uh, volume after volume, hundreds and I would say thousands of books on British naval policy, some of them rather difficult to acquire, hard to acquire in large libraries uh, like Yale or, or uh, Harvard libraries. And so I would come along and sit in the reading room looking like a schoolboy who's found you know, a large number of tins of of jam, <laughs> and I would be pulling out volume after volume of books of the, of the Stephen Roskill Library so I could do my work, Christopher, on uh, Engineers of Victory. It made it much simpler. Thanks for a nice lead question there. Thank you. Good. Well, we'll come back to some of these themes, I think, but let's move on now to um, uh, the, uh, I think, the, the second of our trio. Uh, Margaret Macmillan. Uh, uh, Margaret, again, doesn't need much introduction. I'm sure most people here were, were really struck about her book on the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, they're familiar uh, with work, more recent works on um, uh, the, the Reef Lectures in 2018, her writings on the use and abuse of history, uh, and her role, of course, in academic leadership, for example, as warden of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Um, Margaret, you gave the um, the Reef lectures. Uh, sorry, the uh, Roskill lectures in 2014. 2014. So that was quite a significant year for. Um, oh, wait a minute. Did I? I can't remember. I, I was in 2014. Oh, you no, were 2016. 2016. Okay. okay, 2016. All right. Well, we'll take you first, and then we'll come back to Jonathan. Then. Oh, sorry, I wasn't yeah. trying to take yeah. your time. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sometimes when you look at an old lecture, it's a bit like looking at an old book, and you think, did I actually know all that? Um, and so I looked at it with a certain amount of surprise, but I was so glad to have a, the opportunity to come here, because 
I came here first in the 1990s when I was working on, on what became a book on the Paris Peace Conference, and I found the archives absolutely wonderful. And you, Alan, and others, extremely helpful. And what was so wonderful about them, I think, was, as Paul has, has so wisely said, not just the great memos by the great thinkers, but somehow just reading through them, you've got a sense of a time, and you've got a sense of debates, and you've got a sense of the mentality of the people who are dealing with each other. It, looking at archives gives you a sense of, of a particular historical period in, in a way which I think very little else can do. So I share the gratitude of others to, to these archives. And I also am grateful to Paul, who yet again has made me think about what it is I do. And as you were talking, I was thinking how much the way in which we look at war has changed, and you, of course, have had a great deal to do with this, that we have moved, I think, in my lifetime from the study of war as a phenomenon which involves battles, preparations for war, to looking at it as something that is much more embedded in particular societies and how it's embedded in societies. I mean, the study of war is now not military history so much as it's a study of war and society and what makes wars possible and the impact that wars have on societies. So my lecture was modestly entitled The Meaning of the Great War, um, which I can't believe I tried to do it in 40 minutes. But what <laughs> I did you. talk about That's then, indeed. and I still feel, is the sense of great loss, the sense of devastation, the sense that Europeans had that something had irrevocably changed in their world. And I've now lived through the ending of the Cold War, and possibly the war in Ukraine will have the same impact. But there, there, that ending of the Cold War also gave me and gave many of us that sense that something had changed and, and it was not going to go back. Um, I looked, and I think this is something still with us, at the continuing fascination we have with the First World War, the Great War. It remains a puzzle. How could it have done, how could it have happened? How could Europe have done this to itself, this enormously prosperous and powerful continent turning on itself and with all the products of its advantages, industries and technology, all its social and political organization tearing itself to pieces. And I think we see that continuing fascination in, in the, the movies and the books that still come out about the First World War. I think there are far more novels and movies made about the First World War, plays written about the First World War than there are about the Second. Um, I think partly because we struggle to understand it. I think also it, the First World War still remains the basis of a great deal of international relations theory and debate. Um, was it the balance of power that went wrong? Was it um, hege hegemonic power failing to be a hegemon or too, too many hegemons? I mean, so much of, of what goes on in international relations is often based on, on lessons that were perhaps derived from the First World War. Uh, looking at the First World War also raises issues and questions. How do we prevent war? How do we contain rivalries? These are questions, again, I think, being raised by the war in Ukraine and being raised by the growing US-China rivalry. And so these are not just questions from the past. These are very present questions for us today. I also considered, as we all do, just how much the changes that took place in Europe after the war was over were caused by that war, whether the war itself simply accelerated changes that were already happening in society. And I think if I were to try and decide today, I'd probably do the most unsatisfactory thing of saying it's a matter of both. Um, it's a bit of this and, it, and it's a bit of that. We continue, I think, as we do with other historical periods, but perhaps um, for us, the most pressing questions come from the First World War. What if? What if? the First World War hadn't taken place, or what if Russia hadn't joined in? Would there have been a Russian Revolution? Would that tiny um, fringe group, as they were, the Bolsheviks, have seized power, and would they have changed the fate and the pathway of Russia and the fate of much of the 20th century? Might Austria-Hungary continue to have survived in some form or other? I come from a federal country, Canada, and we constantly quarrel with each other, but we somehow manage to get on. We still hold together um, in spite of dark pr prognostications. Could Austria-Hungary have changed itself enough to maintain some sort of coherence in, in what was an economic and often a social and sometimes a political uh, unit in the middle of Europe? Might the Ottoman Empire have managed somehow to hang on? Um, again, it was changing rapidly without the First World War. We, we'll, we'll never know. If I were looking at those questions again, I think I'd look also much more at the economic side of it and of what was involved in the First World War, and that was the undoing of that earlier period of globalization, the 
world that emerged out of the Great War was a world in which there were tariff barriers, in which there were economic rivalries, in, in ways that I think hadn't been there before, not as intense before the First World War. And then, of course, there are the causes of the First World War. I dashed through these in my lecture uh, 10 years ago. Was it the alliance system? Was it a breakdown in the balance of power? I've never thought it was that the alliance system itself, those alliances were actually quite loose. There were military alliances at the heart of them. But the thing about, about alliances is who enforces it? Who actually says that you have to take part? Italy had signed a treaty with Austria, Hungary, and Germany, and in the end, Italy found a loophole and did not join on their side in the First World War. So I don't think it was the alliance system itself. I think what was dangerous, and I think Christopher Clark and his book brought this out, was the role of the smaller powers, often very reckless, the role of Serbia in causing an incident which then made it difficult for Russia not to back it. I mean, one of the problems that great powers have is they have to continue to show their power, and if they fail to support their smaller allies, then they lose in terms of credibility and prestige. And I think I would have made more of that. I think I would have looked more at the unspoken assumptions, and sometimes spoken, as, as James Joel called them, um, the social Darwinism, I think, was a factor in, in the outbreak of the First World War, the idea that war could be a positive good, and that's still with us today, the importance of nationalism, the importance of militarism. I think if I were giving that lecture today, I'd look much more at the role of education, the ways in which successive generations were brought up to think that their country had a particular right to exist in a particular part of Europe or a particular right to dominate its neighbors. Um, when I look at what's happening in China, where there have now been several generations of young Chinese brought up with something called patriotic education. I worry about what this will mean as tensions grow, as yeah. they're bound to do with the United States. I think, again, today, and that reflects what's been happening in history, I'd look much more at notions of masculinity. I'd look much more at gender ideas. What sort of pressures were on the men who were making the decisions, and they were pretty well all men who were making the decisions in 1914 and making the decisions in 1918. How much did ideas of what it was to be a man enter into the ways in which they behaved and the ways in which they were perhaps afraid of compromise? I would still, as I did then, I think, also look at individuals. Of course, we have to understand the great currents in history. We have to understand sociology. We have to understand demography. We have to understand economics. We have to understand rivalries between nations. We have to understand competition for resources, competition for influence. But I think I'm convinced, again, by what's been happening in recent history, and, and I think, looking back, I do think it actually matters a lot who's in a position of power at a particular time, in a position to make decisions that could lead countries into adopting policies that will either benefit them or not. Um, there were several men in 1914 who had the power to decide whether or not to take their countries to war, and in the crisis, they all bowed to the enormous pressures on them. And I think we're looking at something similar today. I think most of us might agree that it should be called Putin's war in Ukraine, that with a different leader in Russia, you would have had the same, perhaps, nationalist attitudes towards Ukraine, the same fear of Ukraine breaking away, but would another leader have made the decision that Putin made? And we have to think what will happen if President Trump gets back into the White House? What sort of decisions will he make on behalf of the United States? Um, so I think, as I look back at my lecture, I would definitely change it today. I'd look at the ways in which countries dealt with some of the crises, and, and I'd look at the ways in which I think the role of complacency played a part. And I, I think that's, again, something that we may want to think about today, that we can get too used to crises. In 1914, the attitude was, we've had another crisis in the Balkans, so what? We've had a series of crises in the Balkans. Yes, they're serious. Um, yes, there's always talk of war. But there'll be a conference of ambassadors. There'll be a certain amount of bluff. There'll be a certain amount of attempts to make others back down. And perhaps what we've missed, and I think we, we perhaps are suffering from something the same today, is not only the danger of complacency, that we sometimes don't grasp the seriousness of crises until it's too late. But I think what we also tend to miss, and, and I think looking back at the First World War, we miss the, the idea that somehow we aren't really going to do it, um, that we're too sophisticated for it, that this is not the world in which we live. And I do think 
that can be dangerous. I think we have not taken seriously enough some of the issues in the world today, and I think they weren't taking them seriously enough. Um, again, if I were giving the lecture again, I'd look back at the longer term consequences in more detail of the First World War, the brutalization of society, the cynicism that so many felt after the war was over, the, the failures of nations to achieve their goals. So many nations, both on the losing side and the winning side, came out dissatisfied with what had happened. And I think the desire for revenge, the, the, the feelings that you have not been given your due deserts are something that play a very important part in international relations right through the 20th century and, and very important today. And I think I would say much more about that. I'd say much more, I think, about how we end wars. Um, I talked about it a bit in my lecture then, but it seems to me this is one of the critical questions as it was for the 20th century, but also for the 21st century. How do we end wars successfully? How do we put together a world that has been shattered? And of course, mm -hmm. the greater the war, the more difficult it is to end. And one of the things I think we need to be talking about today is how can we end the war in, in Ukraine? It will end mm -hmm. sooner or later. And I think a very stark question for us today is how can it end? Is there anything that the different nations can do to influence its ending? And how do we then deal with the aftermath? Um, we know what happens. I, I've never believed that the First World War led directly to the outbreak of the Second mm -hmm. World War in 1939. My, my short answer to that is what was everyone doing for 20 years? But I do think that it's very important to tr remember that the making of peace is very difficult, very hard, and, and the danger always when a great conflict is over is, is to, in a sense, believe that that has solved the problem. And I think we need to be thinking now, as they should have been thinking then, about how you end wars. So I think I'd Thank probably you. give a very different lecture. I think the word Ukraine would come in a bit, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid the word Trump would come in rather a lot. Okay, well, Thank you've you. given us quite a lot to, to think about there. Um, uh, any question from the floor at this point? Somebody would like to pick something up? Margaret, it's given us things we can talk about at the end, but a uh, gentleman at the back there, green jacket. Um, having taught the First World War in schools, I've noticed that um, there's a sort of clear emphasis on the events rather than its interpretations. So would you like to see greater public engagement with the historiography of the First World War? And if so, how do you think that could be sort of achieved? The question of how we remember is always difficult, and um, two things concern me. When we remember the First World War, we remember it in a very partial way, and that, that's, I suppose, inevitable. But the overwhelming picture, I think, if you, if you live in Britain, which I do part of the year, is the First World War was an absolutely useless war, that people were dragged into it. It was a <coughs> war which involved huge sacrifice. And I think we do a disservice to those in the past who fought it, who thought they were fighting for something. We don't have to agree with them, but I think we ought to respect that. Um, you know, and, and very, very few in, in the schools in England, I well, David, you've written about this, but you know, and, and so has, um, uh, uh, forgetting his name, but as, as one does, but um, the, the number of war poets that are read in British yeah. schools, very, very small, and don't represent the great majority of the poetry that was written. And I think we're not doing a service to the young when we, we give them a particular view of things and don't allow them to understand that there may be other views. And I'm a bit reluctant about historiography um, being taught in primary schools or secondary schools, even in undergraduate universities. I think there is a need to know what actually happened. There's a need to know the chronology. There's a need to know the facts. And so, you know, I sometimes think we pick out things from the past that fit our current pre prejudices and preferences, which we always do. But I think we need to treat the past in, on its own terms with more respect. OK, thank you very much. Um, so let's move on now to Jonathan Fenby. Um, uh, Jonathan is a, a sort of virtuoso writer. Yeah, You've had, I think, 20 books, something like yeah, that, yeah. on a whole Sorry. range of issues, including yes, the Second absolutely. World War, uh, uh, a very uh, prolific journalist but somebody who's kept coming back in his career to the question of China. And that was the subject of your Reef Lecture. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it and then again how you might amend it uh, today? Yes, well, thank you very much, David. 
And above all, thank you, Alan, for having invited me to give the yeah, Roskill yeah. lecture uh, in 2014, it was. I can check back. Um, it was a great honor, uh, privilege, and the, uh, the, while the lecture itself was not, I must say, based on archives here in the Churchill Center, certainly the prominence of the Roskill lecture ensured that it did set off an amount of dis further discussion in China circles, and there is no shortage of uh, that uh, discussion about the, the present and future of China. Um, I am, as you'll have gathered from what uh, David uh, just said, in a sense the joker in the pack, in that I am not the academic historian here, but was a journalist for most of my life. I edited the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, and I've followed China very closely uh, ever since then, uh, the 19, since the 1990s, since the, the, the growth uh, of China. And when I was honored to have been invited by Alan to deliver the Roskill Lecture, the prevalent question about China was whether, or for some simply when, the resurgent People's Republic would dominate the world, replacing the United States as top dog. With GDP rising uh, at a phenomenal rate, uh, it seemed inevitable that it would overtake the United States. And based on its long history, uh, it was uh, history and culture, it was uh, heralded by some, uh, at least, of its supporters as representing a new kind of civilization state uh, separate from the Westphalian uh, Western uh, tradition. Uh, that uh, many of the factors uh, that led to those kind of judgment were undoubtedly true. Uh, China was uh, developing at an enormous rate uh, in the early part of this century and uh, following on from the 1990s. Uh, it had moved from merely making cheap goods which were sold around the world to internal development, particularly uh, on the eastern seaboard, which put uh, many European and American cities uh, to shame. It had the longest uh, high-speed rail network uh, in the world. It was a member of the uh, UN Security Council, a fast expanding military power, and with a, an underlying determination to expunge the, quote, century of humiliation at the hands of foreigners uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. Add to this a population of 1.3 billion, a huge continental land mass, a political system which brooked no opposition, and its history stretching back for thousands of years, and the prediction that the 21st century belonged to China seemed unassailable. I took issue with this uh, in the Roskill lecture, pointing to a number of uh, external and internal factors which I thought would hamper China's rise to predominance in the world. First of all, there appeared that the fragmented post-Cold War world was not uh, a place where one saw one power dominating uh, as the United States had in large parts of the world after the Second World War. Uh, and a part of the US, I thought, always had a greater capacity for G regeneration uh, and uh, an alliance system which would stand in the way of Chinese dominance. But uh, more important than that, I saw um, a number of domestic factors which I thought would hobble China's growth into uh, potential world dominance. Uh, after all, the Prime Minister in the first decade of this century, Wen Jiabao, had warned just before he left office that the economy was unbalanced and unsustainable and that there needed to be a relaxation of the authoritarian power of the Communist Party. I made those arguments uh, in, in the lecture and there was some discussion uh, about them inevitably afterwards. And looking back uh, I, uh, from nine years later, it's not so much that I 
think that I may have been wrong in some of what I said, and here is a, a vainglorious uh, remark to follow, but I may not have been strong enough. Uh, the political power of the Communist Party, which I saw as hampering China's growth, national growth, uh, has grown even stronger over the last 10 years under Xi Jinping. Uh, in his first uh, days in office, Xi had already made it quite clear that he saw the future of China as being in a strengthening of the Communist Party. And that party, with 92 million mem members, it must be said, uh, now permeates all areas of uh, Chinese life to an even greater uh, extent than was the case under Mao Zedong or his immediate successors. It is, uh, even according to some zealots, uh, a matter of concern to the Communist Party what people wear. You should wear national, nationally supporting whole state uh, garments to show your fealty to the party and to Xi Jinping thought, which has become the uh, leitmotif of just about everything uh, in uh, the world, in the country. Uh, and Xi's clear uh, message is that this uh, trend of concentration of party power on, uh, at the top and all through society must remain if China is to find its proper place in what he endlessly describes as an increasingly hostile world. That... Uh, has led, of course, to the abandonment of the Deng Xiaoping doctrine that China should harbor its brilliance, hide its brilliance, and wait for its time to come. For Xi, that time has definitely come. And so we get the international expansion uh, of China, with which you will be familiar, and which we can talk about more, um, which has not been entirely as uh, foreseen by Beijing, I would argue, in that it has aroused uh, considerable opposition uh, for, uh, which has upset a relationship which in, for many in the West had been one of partnership and cooperation up to Donald Trump. And whatever one may say about Trump, he certainly latched on to uh, a theme of China as a dangerous rival, which has been continued by the Biden administration rather more uh, craftily, rather more uh, alliance friendly than was the case with Trump. But still the basic muscle which the United States is using to try to prevent China becoming the number one power in the world remains uh, in place and will de be developed further by uh, the Biden administration. In China, as in the United States and in other countries, the idea of national security has become an increasingly uh, important uh, element in policy and in international politics. And that, again, is something which I think I did not identify and uh, develop sufficiently in my Roskill lecture. We are moving uh, towards a situation where for all the uh, visits to Beijing by senior administration officials from the United States and by cabinet ministers from Britain, uh, basically China is seen as an opponent, is seen as a power which uh, has to be corralled uh, as much as one can manage to do so. Um, and while that is the case, internally in China, as I said, Xi Jinping uh, is presiding over an increasingly nationalistic and increasing national, national security state, which will not uh, give up, I think, and which, in which the leitmotif, the, the watchword, is that China should develop self-reliance. Uh, decoupling goes both ways. Uh, and so I think that probably what I underestimated in the Roskill lecture, and I would like to end by 
uh, referring to today, is that I think we're in for much more stormy wa wa waters ahead, uh, to use a naval uh, expression, um, if only because both the, United, the, the two major powers in the world do not see much room for compromise for increasingly strong domestic reasons. Thank you very much. Well, there's time for a specific question, but I think what Jonathan's talked about is one of the things that we can kick around for a few minutes now as a panel, but is there something anybody wants to raise uh, from the floor? Thank you. We have certain hopes and ideals and, you know, you'd like to see China prosper and Europe and North America do well and so on. So I suppose, what is it when you're studying international affairs that seems that there's a failure of imagination and it comes to, rather than compromising, rather than sitting down, rather than solving things, you know, trying to make the peace, that there's this movement towards conflict difference and, and war. I, mean, I, I, I write on some of these things myself, and it, you know, the older I get, the more naive I seem to be, but I just wondered maybe I, you could teach me a lesson or two on that. Well, I'd just say in, in the case of China and the United States, the basic problem is both sides think they can win, and both sides think that any compromise might uh, jeopardize that ability to win in a, a bilateral, what is becoming increasingly a bilateral conversation, uh, competition. Uh, and assumed to be a zero sum competition. Yes, yes, yes. No, in other yes. words, if, uh, if uh, you gain, I lose. You gain, I lose. <clears throat> and uh, I would say from the American point of view, there was certainly, and I lived through this uh, at the end of the last century, a belief that China, as China grew economically rich, it would become as Bill Clinton once said, although he denied it afterwards, more like us. Uh, and that, Xi Jinping has clearly turned his back uh, on that completely. He sees China, first of all, as a central, as a center of power which needs to be defended, absolutely, and which is under constant attack. And he would like to reshape the global order uh, to achieve that. Uh, and his blunt weapon for that is the Communist Party. And does he have a more like us aspiration about the rest of the world? <laughs> Not really. Um, China has only one treaty ally, which is North Korea. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you see, I mean, while China will reach out the Belt and Road, uh, and the BRICS, in it, BRICS enlargement in, uh, being... Uh, an element uh, in this, obviously. But China basically doesn't, China sees itself, I think, and I think it's going back to an a kind of m imperial mindset. It sees itself uh, as being sufficient unto itself. So imperial, but not imperialist. Not imperialist, not spreading the China model, because you can't spread the China model there. But you have a line, you have so-called strategic partnerships with as many countries as possible. You have a wary relationship with Russia, using Russia uh, to maximum, but not letting it uh, lead you into any uh, risky uh, enterprises. And then you exploit uh, feeling in what is now called the Global South, uh, which is leery of the West and the United mm -hmm. States in particular. So let me open it up to the other two panelists, um, Paul, Margaret, What's your reaction to the things that uh, Jonathan's just been saying about China and its place in the world? I think Margaret should go first. All right. <laughs> yeah. well, I think we always have to be careful when we, we refer to a huge conglomerate as one thing, China. Um, and I think there are different forces, different groups within China which do see, um, which, you know, there is clearly some internal questioning, opposition is too strong a word of Xi Jinping, and I think the past year he's had a number of setbacks. And so I think important to try and keep open 
avenues to other parts of, of China as much as, as much as is possible through, for example, academic contacts. And I know yeah. these, these are tricky. Um, and what strikes me about China is, is you know, we, we are in danger of assuming that it is enormously wise. I mean, if I hear once more about ancient <laughs> Chinese wisdom, I mean, you know, which is just nonsense, I think. I mean, you don't talk about ancient Anglo-Saxon wisdom. In, well, maybe you do, but... Um, well, there are, yeah. are some people here that do. Yeah, well, I, I can only say that if you follow the path of Chinese pol domestic policy, particularly economic policy, over the last 20 years, short-termism is... Yeah. The right. Yeah. But also, what strikes me about China, you know, it, it, if it is so enormously subtle and clever and wise like a serpent, why has it managed to make enemies yeah. of virtually every country around yeah. it? I mean, all it's got is North Korea. Which, I mean, you know, King, you, you really want him as your best friend. <laughs> yeah. um, but the danger, I think, is when in the United States and in China you get policymakers saying not when, not if, but when we fight. And I was, I was quite taken aback. I was at a seminar in, in Washington about three weeks ago with mid-career military, American, very bright, doing a master's at Johns Hopkins. And they said quite casually, when we fight China. And I think that's dangerous because you get into a scenario where everything that China does you think confirms what you're believing. Everything they do you think shows you know, they're about to do something. And the Chinese, I'm afraid, are in the same sort of scenario. Mm. And it's how you break that, I think, is really yeah. important. I really like the uh, questioner's comment <laughs> that the, the older you get, the less certain you are, you understand what it is you're looking at. Um, I, I'm, I see this world of ours in, in as usual, considerable flux, and I see it, uh, China entering a, now a 10-year period of substantial domestic difficulties and contradictions and setbacks, which would put the easy forecasts of the 21st century being China uh, under some big question mark. But we, we're not very good at forecasting over the longer term. And I just wonder whether if we were back here in Jonathan in, in 10 years' time, we might find that the Chinese had been like monitoring everything you pointed to about their weaknesses and then deciding that they're going to repair those weaknesses. It will take some time to do it. It will, uh, they cannot do much about their demographics, of course, and their awful uh, environmental challenges are difficult to think of repairing. But in some other ways, they just might understand that if they slow down, if they do some forms of decent decentralization, uh, less intensification of the you know, political uh, uh, nasty sort of empire in, inside building which is going on the Xi, that this China might look a bit stronger and more competitive in 10 years time. And the United States, uh, especially if Trump gets in and other consequences follow, look a bit weaker and more raggedy and disorganized in 10 years' time. So I'm, le like you, sir, I'm less convinced I know the future, uh, and I'm more willing to just wait and look for the indicators that suggest that whatever the historical pointers are in this particular decade may not necessarily be the pointers which are there in the succeeding decade. I, I come along with an increasing sense of humility about our capacity to predict the future. Thanks. Okay, well, let's uh, accept that, uh, uh, that agnostic comment, but we've been asked, and you've been talking a little bit about um, uh, turning points. Uh, looking back, historians are trying to detect turning points and so on, and. Uh, uh, Margaret's talked in particular about 1914 as a, a turning point in certain respects, or 1919, whatever. If, if, as historians and as commentators on contemporary and historical affairs, you are looking now at, uh, say, two uh, possible putative turning points, the war in Ukraine, uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, how significant do you guess that might be? And at an even more uh, 
stratospheric level, how important is the issue of climate change and the reactions of powers to the climate crisis? Are those going to be issues that we will look back on in the future and say, no, not so important, we got through them, or do you put them pretty high on your list? I put them very high, um, mm. climate change in particular. I mean, I think the trouble is we're not very good. And, I mean, people blame politicians. They say they always think in terms of the next election, so they have a four-year frame or a five-year frame or a six-year frame, but none of us are very good at it. Um, you know, we have trouble thinking more than about six or seven years out. And climate change, you have to think more than that. And I think this summer, you know, we can debate as much as we like about whether there have been previous periods in, in, in the Earth's history like this and, and whether this is man-made or human-made, but something is changing. I mean, the Arctic ice is melting much quicker than, than anyone had expected. What that's going to mean for the oceans, what that's going to mean for the currents that run through the oceans, um, it's very, very difficult to gauge. And, and the severity of the weather that is now occurring, the, the heat waves, um, the tornadoes, you know, we can, we can live with one or two years of this and say, well, you know, every so often you get this. But I think we've got to face that. And the danger is that we're still not focusing on it. Um, I think we're still unwilling to make the changes that we need to make. I mean, I think individuals may well be prepared to make those changes, but we, we need a collective effort and we need international cooperation. And we seem to be going backwards rather than forwards. And if I could just throw in a China element here, of course, that is further complicated by the fact that China has actually moved ahead in things like uh, solar panels, electric vehicles, and so on. And this becomes a geopolitical tug of war as to whether you actually give up and buy Chinese batteries, uh, and so on and so on. No. So, so, um, so David, yeah, if sorry, I may, yeah. so for me as a person interested in relative shifts in power and relative advantages and disadvantages of the major powers, the question is, not that uh, you know, climate change and the rise in Earth's temperatures is not a serious problem and will not impact upon uh, international relations. I'm sure it will, but the question is, which of these countries do you think, ladies and gentlemen, will be less severely affected by big climate change, uh, and which of them will be relatively speaking, hurting. And uh, as I was asked by the editors of a new statement to stick in an additional paragraph on this issue of climate change before that article went to press, um, it occurred to me that I might stick my head out and say that I think that the medium-sized Western European countries like France and Britain, in their uh, moderate climate they have and with their access to the sea, are actually going to be less affected by global climate change than large countries like India <coughs> and much of Africa. And therefore the question is, relatively speaking, is a change in our climate uh, impacts upon society and states going to hurt some parts of the world uh, more than others and less than others. And that's, that's a relative uh, perspective which I think we should uh, keep in mind as well as talking in global terms and broad terms about how climate change will affect humanity or all of the world. Let me just ask one more question and then we'll open it up. But this is again to provoke some thoughts and comments. Uh, I think earlier on, Paul, you started, you were talking about hard and soft power. Others have brought that up. Um, where do you fit now? Uh, I mean, is that a sufficient category for notions of power in the 21st century? Where do you think about uh, cyber power, for example? Where do you fit AI into this? Are we, is the, the binary hard and soft power uh, a sufficiently a uh, flexible uh, concept for us to understand the world we're moving into? I don't think so. The, the notion of soft power first uh, articulated very, very well by uh, 
Joseph Nye, the uh, Harvard political scientist, was simply to be a pushback against those like everybody from Clausewitz to Ranker to, to if you like, uh, Corelli Barnett to, <laughs> to Paul Kennedy, who would talk about hard issues of economic and military power as the only markers and the only way to understand relative power in the world. And Nye was saying, no, there's such things as uh, the, the, the influence of the cultural influence of and attractiveness of certain societies over the other ones, or the the way in which the United States can can turn around and be something that is a much more attractive element and great power diplomacy and culture than a rather nasty looking, inward looking, uh, not very well developed Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So I so I do think that. Uh, Putting the, putting the notion of soft power alongside hard power was a good step then and there 35 years ago. But maybe well, may well be the case that one's going to think hard or have to think hard about the notion of this newer uh, artificial intelligence dimension of power, uh, to, to think through a number of ways in which, uh, I don't know, societies who are very well equipped and trained, scientifically adept, are going to have measures of success in the world which are not just that measured by the number of battleships you have or by the cultural attractiveness of Coca-Cola or some product like that, but a, a newer type of recognition of, of both influence and uh, effectiveness and efficiency in the 21st century that we're in now. Okay. Do either of you like to come in on any of that? No, I mean, I think the, the hard, soft power distinction, which is quite clear, um, for instance, when I was giving the, the Roskill lecture and I made much of the <coughs> failure of China to really export soft power as such, and the fact that you find far more people, you know, in downtown Wuhan on a Saturday night dressed in jeans and dancing to American music, and you'd find people in Birmingham dressed as Ch in Chinese clothes. <laughs> um, but th 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 that was facile in a sense at the time. But I think that that distinction, the binary between hard and soft power, has, is being broken down by technology, in fact and technology which we use every day and which has become part inevitably of our lives and of the lives of an increasing number of people around the, the world. Um, that also has the national security uh, hard power element to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've never seen it as a binary hard and soft power. I've seen them as complementary. Mm -hmm. And some countries have it and some don't. I mean, the United States had, and, and in many ways still has, enormous soft power. The Soviet Union didn't have it, mm. in spite of all the ballet troops it sent to the West and, and, and whatever it did. But I think we're still grappling, and I think Paul's absolutely right, to talk about artificial intelligence. I don't think we really know where it's going yet. No. Um, I think there's some very alarming things. Um, it may put all of us out of work as, as people who write and research. Um, Heaven for fan. Yeah. Um, but um, what, what I do find worrying much more is, is the use of artificial intelligence in war. And there were very good yeah. series, I can't remember the name, but the, the BBC Reese Lectures about two years ago had a very interesting and thoughtful computer scientist who I think was originally British, but uh, is one, one of the big West Coast American universities. And he said the problem with computers or with artificial intelligence at the next level is that they will do what they're programmed to do. And unless you're very careful, they will do things that you didn't mean them to do because they're trying to get to a particular goal. And he had the example of if you want to get rid of um, you know, increasing ozone levels in, in the waters and you, you give a direction to do this, what the entity might do is just get rid of all human beings because we're responsible for most of the increases in ozone levels and that would be the most efficient way to do it. Um, so you know, I think there is a real danger um, and that we will lose the decision-making capacity in war, that you will have autom autonomous weapon systems, which we already have, which will simply go off and do their own thing. And if they're not programmed very carefully, their own thing may be precisely the opposite of what those programming them wanted. Okay, well, we've uh, got some, I think, probably some people in this audience who can comment back on that. So let's open it up now and for the last uh, uh, few minutes. We've got a fair amount of time for questions. Um, I'm going to put my other glasses on to see uh, 
Okay, just fine. That's fine. Yep. Oh, yes, David. Okay. Hi, David Wollen from the Roosevelt Institute. Thank you for a very interesting panel. I'm just curious to the extent when we think about the, the forces behind, you know, 1914 and other events that we've been alluding to today, the jingoism, say, of 1914, uh, the nationalism we talked about in China, and then, of course, the right-wing populism that is so prevalent in the United States and elsewhere, uh, combined with the advent of social media. Uh, again, <laughs> those of us of a certain age, it, it almost feels as if it's, these forces are un uncontrollable um, in terms of their impact on public policy makers. Um, is that, is that, do you think that's the case with the advent of social media, that you know, they are so wedded to this idea of trying to, to react to these um, tweets and, and what have you, um, that, that there's, a, there's a more sort of pernicious uh, force out there in, in, the, in the public sphere? Uh, than there were, say, in 1914? I think the reactions are quicker, but what do social media reactions actually amount to? I mean, they, they can be very ferocious for a day or two, and then the, it's a bit like a, a you know, wave of plankton or something, move in a different direction and pick on a different target. Um, you know, and, and without clear political goals and clear organization, even very popular movements don't achieve very much. I mean, you think of Occupy Wall Street, what did it actually change in the end? You know, there was a great deal of excitement at the time and a great deal of hostility expressed towards capitalism, but in the end, because it lacked leadership, it didn't actually produce any significant changes. And I suspect the Black Lives Matter, although I may be wrong, which was enormously popular, achieved all sorts of, of funding, may well end up not having achieved that much because it lacks clear, coherent goals. Or there, actually, to be fair, there are certain chapters of Black Lives Matters which are clear, which are actually trying to make differences in their neighborhoods. But as a nationwide movement or an international movement, I'm not sure it has actually achieved um, what a lot of those who supported it initially thought it would achieve, achieve. And I think what we also have, I mean, I think we, we do have intense emotions, but I mean, you know, people can only be intensely emotional, most of us, for a very short time, and then something else comes along. Um, I think sometimes politicians pay too much attention to that. They, they, they monitor their, you know, they, they look at their, they take their own political temperatures every five seconds, and I think this, this can be dangerous. And I think what strikes me about the First World War, and what I think is still relevant today, is the role of accident and contingency. You know, if the Archduke hadn't gone to Sarajevo on the stupidest possible day for him to go, I mean, it was yeah. a you know, mm -hmm. great Serbian national holiday. They knew that there, was, there were going to be assassination attempts, that they'd had warnings of it. If he had gone straight to the railway station after the first attempt failed, if he hadn't been killed, Austria-Hungary would not have had an excuse that it wanted to just try and destroy Serbia. And I think, you know, contingency and accident can matter. And what I worry about now is just an accident happening. You know, the, the South China Seas, it seems to me, are just a bit too crowded for comfort. And there have been too many incidents of American and Chinese warships going too close to each other or planes going too close to each other. Mm -hmm. Imagine if there is something that happens. What then happens? What will governments do? What sort of pressures will they feel on them? And we're not very well prepared for those sort of accidents um, and contingencies. We tend to think we are very rational. We can plan everything out. Um, I'm not sure we always do plan, and suddenly events take over. Good. And to, to just, yeah. if I could add, just a PS to that, um, as regards you, you mentioned the South China Sea, but also it's very noticeable how uh, the present administration in Taiwan has been extremely careful throughout President Tsai to avoid giving cause for further accident. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's, I think, a you said one, one there, yes, oh, Lord Votang, and then there's a lady here. Yep. Huge thanks to the panel, it's been fascinating. One word I haven't heard much of from the panel, and I think we ignore it at our peril, is the issue of identity. I mean, I don't think actually uh, Black Lives Matter is is to that point, because Black Lives Matter is essentially an American, US phenomena. It isn't a global one. But well, it certainly isn't in Britain. 
Uh, we have a very different experience yes. in Britain of being black than they do in the United States. Uh, uh, and it's a great mistake to elide uh, the, the two, in my view. But that's really beside the point. When you look at China's influence in Africa, one of the reasons why it is influential in Africa is because it doesn't tell Africans how to live their lives. It doesn't make judgments about how Africans do live their lives. Uh, and it's very dangerous in that, in that respect uh, because there is a strong feeling in Africa that actually African identity is challenged by Western values. And therefore, when China comes along and doesn't seem to challenge African identity, they get a much better reception than we think. So we shouldn't be complacent about the influence of China in Africa. It's growing all the time. They have three military bases now, and it is very, very dangerous. So I, I just want, and the issue of identity too, we shouldn't be facile about it, because while it's perfectly true that people don't dress up in Chinese costume in Manchester, they wear, they wear Chinese clothes. These clothes are made in China. Made, made in. <laughs> and so, and, and that's an issue of, of identity. China, China, there is a Chinese identity, there is an African identity, there is an American identity, there is an Islamic identity. And if we don't put a focus on identity and how identity moves people, not economic interest, actually, identity and faith, because people identify with their faith, moves people. People are not rational. We are influenced by our identity. Okay. Uh, gender identities, gender identity around sexuality, around tribe and race, these are not unimportant. At the end of the day, Serbian identity had its role in the events of 1914. Mm -hmm. It is the way of the world. So we have to think about identity, it seems to me, okay, and I'd thank like you. to hear more about it. Yeah. Thank you. So how, reactions from the panel to, to that? Well, on China, and I, I'll, I'd be interested to hear what Jonathan says, um, the Chinese have not actually been all that successful in Africa in winning friends and influencing people. Um, what they have done is win over elites. Yeah. Um, they have not, I think, developed a very good reputation for themselves among the general population in, in many African countries where they're seen as bribing those elites, um, bringing in their own labor, not giving jobs to African workers. Um, the Chinese, I, I think, you know, but also let us remember that there is not a single identity. I mean, you talk about a Muslim identity. There are many Muslim identities. Um, and many people, including me, have different identities. I'm, I'm not primarily one thing or the other. We have multiple identities. And that's true of people in, in, the, in the Islamic world as much as it is of, of, of people in, in the, what remains of the Christian world. So, you know, I think we, we need to be careful about assuming that there is this very strong thing called identity which drives people into particular boxes and, and is very powerful. No, I, I just I'd agree entirely. I think if you look in Africa at specific cases, Zambia being an example there, uh, the Chinese got on well with the government by lending them a lot of money, by funding a, a, a lot of projects, that, pet projects for the government and not asking any questions. But among the people, if one can say that, and farmers, uh, the, the Chinese were not popular yeah. at all, setting up farms which then sold eggs and, you know, the, most of the egg producers in Lusaka at one point were, were practically bankrupted by Chinese coming in on the coattails of these big government projects. So I think, that, I think there's a, a nuance there that needs yeah. to be taken into account yeah. there. At the same time, identity, since we've mentioned China, is one of the, I think, uh, big themes which Xi Jinping is anxious to make the most of, Chinese identity all the time. So we still get the century of humiliation uh, being talked about. Uh, everything is the fault of the foreigners, whereas, in fact, if the decline of China in the 19th century was largely due to internal Chinese factors, I would argue, than... The, the foreigners, not, not to excuse them at all. But identity is something that can be conjured up very easily, uh, as we've seen in a lot of uh, populist movements. Mm. Paul? It, it's, it's really fascinating, this conference of yours, Alan. Uh, we've sort of drifted from the ways in which scholars at different levels of uh, 
particular careers and in different parts of their inquiry have used this wonderful Churchill archives to uh, getting closer and closer to our contemporary angst, uh, chiefly about China, and wondering to what extent we can do some uh, forecasting or offer thoughts about the world where we are now and where we might be going. Uh, I, I don't mind that. That might have been your intention in any case, to say, let's put all of these people together, and then what will happen is that the pertinence and the utility of a collection of an archive like this will be seen, ladies and gentlemen, not simply because of the historical investigations by younger scholars and more mature scholars, but also by the way in which it can make us think about using these sources and sending historians in and bringing historians here, uh, make us think about large contemporary issues uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, my hesitation in you know, coming any further out of this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, even as we focus in a debate about like whether China or will the United States be competitive, um, I, I, I'm never quite sure when I'm listening to the speaker whether um, they have, they've got everything right about the complexity of this situation. I'm teaching a, a couple of classes at Yale now where I ask my students who are uh, very bright but very keen to opine about everything, mm -hmm. if we could spend a little bit of time trying to uh, memorize that wonderful poem on the six blind men and the elephant. <laughs> uh, some of you may know it, it was the, the, uh, the, it was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. And as the paragraphs, as the stanzas unfold, every one of us, and we academics are the guilty ones, every one of us, but one of the blind men of Hindustan got a hold of the side of the elephant and said, this must undoubtedly be a wall. And another one got a hold of a swinging tail and said, this must be a snake. Mm -hmm. And another one bumped into the leg and said, this must be the trunk of a tree, and so on. And the students begin to get the fact that what we are in danger of is too much getting a hold of a certain part of a story, a certain amount of data, a certain amount of trends, and then saying, this is the way we, they are going, and this we are, we're very certain about this. Mm. Now, the danger of listening to people like Professor Kennedy is that at the end of the day, we are saying, I'm not quite sure about anything, <laughs> 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 which is an ignoble thing for a university professor to have. Uh, but I do, I do wonder whether... You know, we, this wonderful conference of yours, Al, may, may drift towards our knowing uh, as much about the 21st century as the archives are suggesting we know about the 20th and the, 20, and the 19th century. Um, what, a, what a wonderful joy it is to be in the midst of this. Okay, I think we have, um, this is remember the author of The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers who's talking about elephants. There's a lady here, you I see think, with a question, in and then we need to it to an end, I think. Yeah, well, I actually think perhaps now Paul said that. I shouldn't ask my question because I'm a journalist. And Paul, the journalists always ask the what next question. Uh, so I wanted to pick up on good. something you said about climate change and direct the question to Professor Macmillan. I know that I listened to a speech the late Shirley Williams gave, a hugely uh, respected Liberal Democrat politician at St Edmunds College way back, and she's a friend of Lord Stern's and the Pope then. But might not climate change itself be a precursor to war? Well, okay. lots of things can be a precursor to war, and what climate change will intensify is, is competition over resources. Um, what it will also it intensify, I think we're already seeing it, is movements of people, um, which may not in themselves cause war, but will certainly create um, 
increasing international tensions as, as different nation states try to deal with them. Um, you know, we've never had any trouble in the past of finding reasons to fight each other. And I think climate change will intensify some of those reasons. And we're already seeing, um, you know, the growing tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt over water, um, and Sudan, of course, as well. And the, you know, these these are things that will be intensified by climate change. Uh, okay. Well, I think we are supposed to bring things to a close now, but. Um, uh, because uh, champagne or, uh, awaits, but um, uh, just two things. First of all, um, I'm taking the liberty of asking you to block into your diary uh, the uh, 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 date yet to be exactly defined in September 2073, when the centenary conference uh, of the archives, which Alan is already planning, we'll be there. Uh, and we'll all be here to, to talk about this, and we will be able to test some of the accuracy, some of the, the uh, predictions that have been made or avoided. Um, but uh, finally, just to thank our three panelists for talking so interestingly about the Roskill Lecture, about the way it's evolved, the way their own thinking has evolved, and reminding us again of what a huge contribution to the life of the college and the intellectual life more generally of this country successive Roskill Lecturers have given us through the generosity of the Roskill family and the far sight of Stephen Roskill. Yeah. So thank you all very much. Okay, and thank you very much, David, for, for chairing that panel. Um, yes, so 2073, we will be planning on placing the New Statesman headline of, for Paul's um, subsequent article. But um, um, there'll be plenty more contemporary angst tomorrow. Um, and this only concludes the formal sessions um, for today. We're hoping very much that the discussion, the debate can go on now um, over champagne and then for some of us um, over food. So everyone who is here now is now invited to a champagne reception in the Jock Colville Hall of the Archive Centre. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's just out and around the side of the building, but follow the sign, follow the, follow the sound of the champagne corks um, um, popping and, and the archives team will be there to direct you. For those of you staying to dine tonight, dinner's going to be in the main dining hall. There is no seating plan and we'll be gonged through um, from the, the, the Jock Colville Hall in due course. If you have dietaries, um, there will be cards for you to pick up representing your particular diets from a table just outside the main dining hall. Um, but on that note, um, time to adjourn for today, and we will restart the formal session at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.